Let's turn our attention now to a text that's been referred to half a dozen times at least already in this conference, which we find in Genesis chapter 15, and I'll begin at verse 1, where we read these words. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, saying that I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed God, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Let me move quickly to another passage that has also been referred to frequently in this conference, to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he's something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, as we now direct our attention to this transcendently majestic concept of imputation by which we are redeemed, we ask that you would stoop to our weakness of understanding to melt the hardness of our hearts, remove the blinders from our eyes, and give us ears to hear what this concept of imputation means for us and for our salvation. Amen. The word to impute that is used in the Bible may be defined in several ways, and sometimes it is used to mean to ascribe something to someone, to attribute something to someone, to reckon, to count, to deem, or even in legal terms, to transfer something from one person to another. But when the Bible speaks of God's work of justification, it uses this term, imputation, in a legal sense or in a forensic sense. 
Now that term forensic may be one with which you're not familiar. I wonder how Chuck and his team are rendering it uh, to the hearing impaired. You have some way to communicate it. But in, if you watch uh, criminal trials on television, you know that the prosecution always presents what they call forensic evidence. This is evidence that is brought to bear in the courtroom that becomes that which contributes to the final declaration that the judge makes with respect to the defendant's guilt or innocence. And so we often define the concept of imputation and even the doctrine of justification as forensic justification. Now there's some confusion here. The term forensic justification in the history of Reformed thought is a kind of theological shorthand for the idea that God declares people just who in themselves are not just, but God counts them as just by virtue of some kind of transfer of justice from somewhere else. And so, as a matter of shorthand, we speak of the reform view of justification as being forensic. That's a little bit misleading. When we saw many years ago the initiative in America where an agreement was hammered out between evangelical leaders and representatives of the Roman Catholic Communion entitled Evangelicals and Catholics Together, where both sides testified that they had a unity of faith in the gospel, from which some shrunk in horror uh, among those I was included. A unity of faith in the gospel when we've been fighting for all these centuries over what the gospel is. And so those who were involved in this initiative and who were critiqued for it were pressed to say what they have done with this doctrine of justification by faith alone. So a second initiative came forth in which a much longer and extended definition of agreement on justification was set forth. And one of the signatories of that document, who is a, a highly respected church historian in America called me in a spirit of unbridled excitement. He said, do you realize what this document means, R.C.? He said, this is the greatest breakthrough in Roman Catholic Protestant dialogue in the last hundred years. Do you realize that the Roman Catholic signatories on this document have affirmed forensic justification. I said, yes, I noticed that. And I said, are you a teacher of church history? And you don't know that the Roman Catholic Church has always taught forensic justification. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, both sides have agreed that in the final analysis, no one is justified until or unless God Almighty declares them to be justified. But the abiding issue is on what grounds is this declaration made? On what basis will God declare anyone just in his sight. Well, what Protestantism has been saying for centuries is that the only possible grounds by which God will ever declare anyone just in his sight is on the grounds of the imputation of the righteousness of Christ and on that ground alone. 
That is the idea that stood behind Luther's famous maxim, simul justus et peccator, or for those of you who don't want to go to heaven and talk to Paul in Latin, <laughs> means simply at the same time just and sinner. It was that formula of Luther that Rome thought was abhorrent. Because Luther says that in our justification, we are at the same time just in one sense, but sinner in another sense. Well, in what sense? Well, if God were to gaze upon our souls and analyze the actual state of our souls, he would see manifold sin clinging to it, as John MacArthur so eloquently expounded the other day. And so God would see what's there, and he would still see a sin-blistered sinner. So how could one who is a sinner in any way still be just? And what Luther was getting at was this, that in and of himself the, sin, the sinner is a sinner, but by imputation he is declared to be just because the righteousness of Christ is accredited to him. It's counted for him. It is reckoned to him. And that the whole sense of justification biblically is based on this supreme principle of being declared just not because we are just in and of ourselves, not because righteousness inheres in us, but because God in his mercy has counted the righteousness of Christ for us. And the Roman Catholic response to that was, this cannot be because it would involve God in a legal fiction. It would involve God's declaring somebody to be something that in fact they were not. And this God of truth and of purity will never declare that a person is righteous or just unless or until that person actually is just or righteous. If there was any single word that was the stumbling block for all attempts of reconciliation in this controversy in the 16th century, and any single word that remains that rock of stumbling even to this day, it is this word and this concept of imputation. And when Paul responds to this question, he takes his reader back to the 15th chapter of Genesis, where I started today, where Abraham, though being one of the wealthiest men in all of the world, receives a visit from God, and God makes a promise to him saying, Abram, I've got good news for you. I will be your shield. I will be your exceedingly great reward. And if Abraham, the father of the faithful, ever indulged in cynicism, is when he heard those words and he had to be thinking, this can't be God speaking to me. What do you mean? I'm going to get this wonderful gift. I have already everything a man could want. But the one thing that matters, I don't have. My heir, 
is my servant, Eliezer of Damascus. He lives in my house. He serves in my house. But he's not my son. My wife is barren. And so everything I have, I leave to this servant from Damascus. So what more reward could you possibly give to me? God says, come here, Abram. Step outside for a minute. There wasn't any cloud in the sky that night. If you've ever been to the Middle East, you know how thin the atmosphere is and how clear the heavens appear. That the Milky Way, from the vantage point of that area of the world, appears as a gigantic cloud. And God said, let's just take a few minutes here, Abraham. I want you to look up there, and I want you to look at those stars. And do me a favor, please, if you can, count them for me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. You can go by tens, twenty, thirty, forty, sixty, eighty. If you want to go by 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, maybe you should try by millions or billions. It's okay, Abraham. I have all eternity to finish this counting. Maybe you don't. But he said, Abraham, Eliezer of Damascus will not be your heir, but a son will come from your own loins. And your descendants will be as the stars of the sky. And here's what the Bible said. The Bible does not say at that moment, well, Abraham believed in God and believed that God was omnipotent and that with God all things are possible. This, at that moment, was not an examination in systematic theology. It doesn't say that Abraham believed in God. This is what Sinclair was getting at so masterfully in his last lecture. But he believed God. He looked at those stars and God said, that's how many descendants that you will have. Do you believe that? Do you receive that? Do you trust me on that? And Abraham said, yes, Lord. I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And when Abraham believed God, the Bible says, God counted it to him for righteousness. God declared Abraham just. He declared him justified before he was sanctified. This is so plain, so clear, I don't see how anybody could miss it if they go back over to Romans 4 when Paul doesn't just mention this in passing. He said, you want to understand justification, let me give you exhibit A. Abraham, before he had done anything righteous before he was ever circumcised, before he did any of the works of the law, before he was sanctified, before he went to Mount Moriah and offered to the child of promise there. God counted him righteous in his sight. A legal fiction? If the imputation of righteousness is a legal fiction unworthy 
of God's veracity, then the imputation of my sin to his son is likewise a legal fiction, and Jesus did not die for my sins. If imputation involves a legal fiction, then when Adam sinned in paradise, he sinned for Adam and for Adam alone, as Pelagius maintained, and not as the representative of the entire race, that by his disobedience, the whole world is plunged into ruin. The whole world is plunged into death because the guilt of one man was imputed to another. If you don't like this concept of imputation, not only do you do away with justification, you do away with original sin. You do away with the atonement of Jesus Christ. And if you're Roman Catholic, you do away with the transfer and reckoning of anybody's merit from the treasury of merits to you or your grandmother. Because the whole of salvation from start to finish rests on imputation. And it is not a legal fiction, and I'll tell you why. When God imputes the sin of Adam to me, it is a real imputation. There's nothing fictional about it. When God imputes my guilt to the back of Jesus as the sin bearer, there is nothing fictional about it. It is a real imputation. And when he transfers to me the righteousness of Christ by faith, it is a real imputation. And it is the reality of that imputation by which we can ever hope to stand before God. A reference has already been made to Luther's understanding of the basis of our justification is being based on righteousness and righteousness alone. You know, we keep talking about justification is by faith and by faith alone. And yet out of the other sides of our mouth, we have to say, wait a minute. Justification is not by the doctrine of justification. When I came to Christ on my knees and confessed my sin, I'd never heard of the doctrine of justification. I had no concept of imputation. I was only a sinner convicted by the Holy Ghost and I fled to the cross and I begged God to forgive me. I was like that publican in the temple said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's all I knew. So I wasn't justified by waiting until I understood the doctrine of justification. And as Sinclair was telling us before, you can make an A plus on an examination of the doctrine of justification by faith and still be far from the kingdom. All that the doctrine does is explain how it happens. And as I said yesterday, the doctrine of justification by faith alone is simply shorthand for the statement justification by Christ alone. Now here's where it gets tricky. The only way anyone can ever be saved is by works. God requires that his law be fulfilled. And unless you possess perfect righteousness, you will never be justified. Now the issue is this, by whose works will you be justified? Justification by faith alone means that we're justified by the works of Christ alone. By a righteousness that Luther called an alienum justitium and 
foreign righteousness, a righteousness, one more Latin, that's extra nos, that's outside of us. It is not inherent. It is not my possession. It's Jesus' possession. Again, if Jesus, uh, John Guest once preached a sermon on the blood of Christ, and he said if Jesus would have scratched his finger on a nail, would that have done it? There's blood, there's Jesus' blood. No. When it says we're saved by the blood of Christ, it means that we're saved through that blood unto death. And if the only thing that saves us is Jesus dying on the cross, why didn't God just send him from heaven directly to Mount Calvary? Say, son, get down there and get crucified. Let's get it over. Why did he come as a baby in a manger? Why did he come under the law? Because for Jesus to save us, he not only had to die for our penalty, but he had to live for our righteousness. We are saved as much by the perfect act of obedience of Jesus as we are by his sacrificial death. Now, in the Bible, there are several metaphors for this concept of imputation, ways in which it is described and likened, and I'm going to take just a few minutes to go over some of these. One of the most important ways in which imputation is illustrated in Scripture is through the analogy of a covering. And where does this start? It starts in Genesis, where we're told that God makes Adam and Eve in his own image and puts them in this wonderful garden and all. And then at the end of the chapter, like a dangling participle or concluding unscientific postscript, there's this strange statement that says, and the two of them were naked and not ashamed. What's that have to do with anything? Until soon, we read of the serpent who was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field, and he comes and he seduces Adam and Eve, and as soon as they sinned, the first human experience of guilt was a profound experience of shame, of an acute awareness of walking around without any clothes on. And so they flee for the trees and they hide and try to cover their nakedness. And God comes in the cool of the day and calls to Adam, Adam, where are you? I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? Because I'm naked. What? Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree? Well, you know, the woman that you gave to me. <laughs> so now God comes and he puts his curse on the woman. He puts his curse on the man, on the whole world, and on the serpent. And he expels them from the garden and places an angel with a flaming sword lest they get back in. All of that is punitive. All of that is punishment for sin. But the very first divine act of redemption was that in his mercy, God personally came down and made for his shamed, embarrassed, guilt-strangled creatures, 
clothes and covered their nakedness. Remember when Desmond Morris wrote his analysis of, of primates, in which he entitled his book The Naked Ape, and consider us just animals, just like other gorillas and orangutans and chimpanzees. He said the one thing that distinguishes this monkey from all the rest of them is that we go around wearing artificial clothes. Did you ever notice that? Why is that? Every time you see somebody dressed, any time you put a shirt on, a blouse on, a dress on, a pair of pants on, you ought to remember where the whole idea of clothes came from the first time. By the mercy of God, so that you don't have to parade your shame in front of the whole watching world. Fast forward for a moment to the establishment of the cultus of Israel and all of the instructions that God gives in the law for the celebration of the Passover, for the construction of the tabernacle, for the fashioning of the sacred vessels that are to be found in it, and then for the ultimate sacramental day, the Day of Atonement, where elaborate instructions are given to the high priest, who is directed to go and get animals, a bull, two goats, and a goat and a bull, at least one, are used where their blood is taken into the Holy of Holies. And what's done with that blood? The blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat between the cherubim. Which mercy seat indicates the throne of Almighty God, before which throne we are all guilty? But the priest, under God's instruction, takes this blood and covers the mercy seat, symbolizing the covering of our guilt from animal skins to animal blood. Of course, the other goat goes through the ceremony where the priest puts his hand on the back of the goat who is designated the scapegoat. And what's that gesture mean? When he places his hands on the goat, he is transferring symbolically the sins of his people onto the back of that goat. Imputation. Now the goat is reckoned as the sin bearer and he is driven into the wilderness, outside of the camp, outside of the presence of God, out into the outer darkness so that the sin of the people may be removed from the presence of God, symbolically. Fast forward to the New Testament. And we read there that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. That the whole drama of the Day of Atonement was a shadow of the reality that was to come. The blood of the bull, the blood of the goat had absolutely no efficacy whatsoever to cover your sin or mine or Moses or Aaron's. It looked forward. And symbolically sang the Agnus Dei before John the Baptist ever appeared on the scene and said, Behold the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sin of the world. Again, as Sinclair went through Isaiah 53, passage after passage after passage, God lays upon him, God bruises him, God counts his servant as the one who carries away our guilt. That is imputation. Finally, the language of the New Testament goes back again to the language of Genesis of the making of these garments where the New Testament describes our salvation and our justification as being accomplished through being clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Being given a garment that covers us. The Bible says that all of our righteousness is what? Filthy rags. Zechariah is, in, in the book of Zechariah, Joshua the priest is accused by Satan, saying, how can he minister before you? Look at him, his turban's filthy. He's got dirt all over his hands. Somebody asked me not too long ago, what do you think is the most important book that you ever wrote? I said, I don't know. But it may be in the final analysis, the children's story, the priest with dirty clothes, drawn from that story in Zechariah, where we see the double transfer. My filthy clothes are put on Jesus on the cross, and the garment of his righteousness is given to me by imputation. Well, how important is this? In the second iteration of EC2, ECT2, People were all excited about so much agreement that had gone on, and at the end of the document it said they're leaving this question of imputation on the table for further discussion. You know, justification can't be by the imputation of the righteousness of Christ and not by the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. There is no middle ground. There is no possible synthesis. It is either imputation or it's not imputation. And what we try to get our friends to understand is that without sola fide, you do not have the gospel. And without imputation, you don't have sola fide. So QED, without imputation, you do not have the gospel. The doctrine of the imputation of the righteousness of Christ to us by divine declaration, which happens through faith, again is not tangential, accidental, a simple add-on. It is at the heart and the soul of the gospel. It is of the essence of the gospel, so without it you don't have the gospel. When Jim Kennedy developed Donald Gray Barhouse's illustration of evangelism and created evangelism explosion and taught people how to communicate the gospel, he used an illustration that I found helpful. And with that, I'll close. He said, we have two books. And the book in this hand has a thousand pages, and they are blank. And every time you sin, a mark is put in this book on the pages. Now, this is your 
life. How many marks are there in that book? The only thing you have to ask, is there any part of that book that isn't marked? He said, on the other hand, I have a book of the life of Jesus. How many marks are in his book? How many sins have marred his life? And you know the answer. No, not one. And Jim Kenney said, here's how our salvation happens. On the cross, God takes this book and puts it on Christ. And when we put our trust in Christ, God takes his book and puts it on me. My sin to Christ, his righteousness to me, it doesn't get any better than that. Let's... Let's pray. Lord, we know that if you would mark iniquity, none of us could stand, and yet you did mark our iniquity. But you put it upon your Son and exchanged our filthy garments for the cloak of his righteousness you covered our nakedness and our shame. For eternity is not enough time to sing your praise for the mercy of that transaction. Let us, O oh God, be willing to die for it without compromise. Amen.